Hola, bendiciones. So, my name is Colleen Nanichak, and I am a new missionary with the Evangelical Covenant Church of Canada and serve globally. And while my home church is the Nelson Church, all three churches really are our home for me. And today, I'm excited to share with you my journey and what God's been doing. But first, oramos. Let us pray. Dios Padre, te doy gracias por esta oportunidad de compartir tu palabra. Te damos gracias por este lugar en que vivimos, nuestras familias, por todo lo que haces. Pido a Dios, quien va a ser glorificado, Espíritu Santo, quien hablará a través de mí, el pueblo podrá ver y oír y sentir la presencia de Cristo. Señor, lo pido en nombre de tu precioso Hijo Jesucristo. Amen. Father God, I thank you for this opportunity to share your word. I pray that you will be glorified. Holy Spirit, I ask that you speak through me, that the people see, hear, and feel your presence, Christ. Lord, I ask this in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, two years ago, when we got off the plane in Buenos Aires, I was petrified to try my limited Spanish, simple questions, single word. That was about it. But today, I want to share a couple of scriptures with you. In Psalm 40, 40 verses 2 and 3, David writes, He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on solid ground and steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. And in 1 Peter 1.6, Peter writes, So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. And these are words that God has used to keep me grounded over the last six months. My journey began years ago, and it felt like God had already met me in the darkness, in the scary, dirty corners of my soul that I never wanted to go to, but found myself in. But right now, I want to share with you what has been the highest mountaintop experience and also the deepest valley bottom. My husband Max and I were together for 27 years, and my life was so entwined with his. He was everything to me, and we were everything to each other. We didn't start our relationship, our life together with Christ anywhere in it that we were aware of, but we came to know Christ together, and our entire walk has been as one. We shared love and joy, sickness and loss, adventures both big and small, good and bad. And Max was full of passion, love, and life. And nothing we ever did seemed to fit within the realm of normal. In 2008, we even wanted to ride our motorbikes from Alaska to the tip of South America. But we went in another direction. And in 2014, God really put on our hearts to serve him more. We began to say, yes, Lord, no more excuses. We felt pulled in the direction of missions in South America, but we were thinking about part-time kingdom work, serving for six months and being back in Canada for six months to work and self-fund. We were a little bit independent. We started working towards this, though, thinking that it wouldn't start for a few more years, and our mantra began open hands, surrendered hearts. It's all the Lord's anyways, right? Our lives, our marriages, our stuff. And we went on the Canada Conference Ecuador trip in February of 2016, and it was there that missions was put on our heart even more. We started downsizing our stuff, looking at living and traveling in a school bus with our bikes, and we began discussions with Dale Lusk at Merge Ministries which is the Covenant Short-Term Mission Initiative, and they facilitate and organize short-term trips 
There's opportunities for youth and young adults with global internships, as well as for individuals, couples, and families with global immersions. And Merge really does provide a wealth of knowledge and logistics. In October of 2016, we had a chance to join two different churches from the United States on their short-term trips, one in Nicaragua, one in Ecuador, back-to-back, -back. and we said yes to both. We sponsor a girl, Wendy, through Compassion Canada in Nicaragua, so since we'd be there, we were able to make arrangements to meet her, and we also thought that we'd revisit the people in Cayambe, where we were in February. So one month, great. Then Dale came back to us and said he had an opportunity for three months in Argentina. Okay, no more excuses, right? So we said yes. Then we had to figure out how to make four months work. But really, we didn't have to figure it out. We just had to surrender and be obedient. God already had that figured out. Now, about halfway through our time in Argentina, in the middle of Patagonia, God grabbed hold of my heart and clearly told me he didn't want this six-month thing. I was to serve him full-time there. But what I didn't know was that at the same time, God also grabbed Max and told him the same thing. And it took us about two weeks of praying together, praying individually, before we got up the courage to talk to each other about it. And what a special day that was when we learned that God had called us both to serve him full time. So remember that motorcycle trip? Maybe that wasn't entirely our plan after all. We returned to Canada and at the end of January, at the end of January and we spent several months going through the process to become missionaries. Canadian Covenant Missionaries with the Evangelical Covenant Church of Canada and Serve Globally. Serve Globally is one of our five mission priorities of our covenant denomination, our sending agency, if you like. And Max and I had such a wonderful and precious time together over the last couple of years, moving towards what some called a radical, questionable life, putting the house and property on the market, Max sold his excavator, his trailer, his truck. Open hands, right? We said yes. We didn't completely know how this was going to come together, but we trusted, we surrendered, and we obeyed. In June of 2017, we completed our missionary training, and we were commissioned at the Covenant's annual meeting called Gather as new missionaries, the first Canadian missionaries in a long time the first missionaries to Argentina in a long time, and we would be the only covenant missionaries there in Argentina. We then spent over two months on the road, from July to mid-September, visiting church churches across Western Canada, sharing about missions, about Argentina, about ourselves. We camped out in between churches. We spent time preparing for our licensing interview that was going to take place in October. And I wouldn't trade a moment of that for anything, almost anything. I can look back now, and I can see how God was leading and guiding and providing such a richness in our lives, in our marriage, in our friendships. And what then happened on September 13th would turn my world upside down and shake me to the very core. We had a fantastic drive coming back from Dundurn, Saskatchewan to Weimar, BC. It's about a 12-hour drive, and we took all day to do it. Our plan was to hole up in the house the next day and finish our papers for licensing. When we got home, this great day turned into the worst day of my life. Max suffered a heart attack, and in a few short hours, I lost the love of my life. Was this God's plan? His will? I can't answer that. Was this just an event that happened because we live in a broken world? I don't know. 
Did God allow death to take Max? God could have said, no, death, you can't have this one. He's mine. And, and maybe God did have that conversation. Was God in control of this, of Max's death? Can I be honest with you? I really can't answer that. But I do know how involved God was that day because we were home. The car was unloaded and we were settled before this chaos ensued. And looking back, I can see and admit how involved God was over the past few years. All the details that are in place, all the things that are set in motion. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot over the last few weeks with everything that's been happening and asking these questions. And I really had to ask myself, does the answer matter? What's the benefit or the cost to knowing that? It's not going to change anything. It's not going to change the fact that he's not standing here with me. But I know that our God is sovereign, that his love doesn't change, his faithfulness doesn't change, and that he is here with me. And at that moment, though, the only thing that I knew was that Max was welcomed home by the Father. And my world as I knew it had changed forever. And I am so thankful for everyone, for all of you who were instantly there and continue to be here at my side, to carry me, support me with prayers, with your presence. So many things that were just looked after and I can't say thank you enough. I felt so lost in the beginning. I had no clue what I was supposed to do now. Over the months, God and I have had many discussions, mainly one-sided, with me throwing my thoughts and emotions and opinions to him. What was his plan? Did I misunderstand it? Did we misunderstand it? How was I going to live this life? How could I move forward? I didn't know if I could live life without Max. I didn't know if I wanted a life without Max. And a good friend challenged me though. I would never want a life without Max, but was I willing? And while I couldn't even wrap my head around this life without him, yes, I was willing. And every day was and continues to be stepping forward in faith, believing in the unseen, trusting God and surrendering fully again and again, and then obeying and responding. The house stayed on the market. That was the decision that we had already made, and to move from that was a huge change. Moving felt forward felt right in my heart, even though I knew nothing of the future past that. And I give praise for God's hand on the sale of the house. From how the offer came together, the details that were in place, to the people that came to repack, do dump runs, donation runs, everything. And I have a huge mantra of scripture. It's written on post-it notes. It's up on mirrors. They're with me. They're everywhere. And they keep me focused on Christ. They are the ropes that I hang on to that keep me and prevent me from completely falling into that dark abyss. And through the first month after losing Max, I was camped out in Psalms and still am to some degree, but especially Psalm 40. I was fully face down, buried in the mud and mire, but I am grateful to have a compassionate, patient father who keeps lovingly picking me up, sometimes kicking and screaming, but he picks me up and he sets me on a firm foundation. He steadies me. And this foundation has given me the solid reality to keep going in life, to continue in God's will. And the fact that he has to steady me, it reminds me that if he has to steady me, things are going to be a bit wobbly, bumpy, stormy. And it also tells me that if he, in order for him to steady me, 
I have to be hanging on to him tightly and constantly. In Isaiah 41, 9 and 10, I hear, I have called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, You are my servant, for I have chosen you and will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. And one evening, sitting on Max's bike and crying out to God, I don't understand your plan, your will. I don't agree with it. And quite frankly, it sucks. I don't know what to do. You called us individually to serve you. We did. Or did we get it wrong? Did we pick up our individual calls and put them together and run ahead of you? Did Max's call to mission just look different than mine? What am I supposed to do? And just like in the middle of the Argentina, God gently but firmly grabbed my heart and I felt a stern, are you going to serve me? And I had this vision of a kid throwing a temper tantrum because I wasn't getting what I wanted. It wasn't going the way we had planned it. And I had to stop and after a few moments say, well, yes, I'm going to serve you, but I don't understand how to serve you now. To say no in my heart would be to completely turn my back on God, and that wasn't an option. But again, my heart heard a little gentler, are you going to serve me? My temper tantrum continued. Yes, but how do I serve you without Max? I don't even know how to live life without Max. We already started serving you. And again, are you going to serve me? I've already told you. Why do you keep asking? And the sense of calmness and peace came over me. And I got off the bike and I walked around the house going, okay, okay. All right, this I know. I still didn't know what it would look like, but surrender and obedience. And now, looking back, there is such an importance, such a significance to our individual call. I don't know if any of you can relate to this, but I'm a person who prefers to have A to Z all figured out. And I'm learning right now to know what T is, and when God needs, to know, needs me to know what D and M and R are, he does. And I'm learning to be okay with that. I took some time with friends in Norway after the house sold and really spent some intentional time processing this grief, resting, and beginning to heal. This has been an intense time of grief. It's a journey and certainly a process. I'm still in it but the times of being face down in the mud are getting less. And while there in Norway, I was asked to share a little about this journey and what was coming up. God took me back to Psalm 43. He gives me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise, and he really spoke to me. How would people really know what Christ is doing if I don't share and talk about this? So I do. At least I'm trying to. This sharing, this being vulnerable with you, is not something that comes easy for me. But I step forward in faith and trust. God hears my pain, my hurt, my anger, my confusion, doubts, and hesitancy. And I've told him many times that he called the wrong person home. He should have kept Max here for this. I've told him, I don't know if I can do this. Really, Lord? You already called us. We already surrendered, stepped out in faith, and we're trusting and obeying your will in our lives. And I feel like you pulled the carpet out from under us, and you cleaved Max and I apart, and not gently. And now, you're asking me to step forward again in faith and surrender, to trust you, and obey you, to step where I had already stepped and had my world shaken to its core? I don't know about this. 
But the Father understands my hesitancy, my doubts and fears, and he tells me that there is wonderful joy ahead. I will face trials, but only for a little while. I'd really like to put a time frame on this, but it does assure me, and it gives me comfort on the tough days that there will be joy ahead, that this pain isn't forever. In Isaiah 48, 10 and 11, he tells me that this suffering, this refining is for his sake. I don't like it. It hurts. And I wouldn't want any of you to have to go through this. But the closeness, the intimate relationship that I have it with Christ now, I don't know if I would have gotten any other way. And I can see now that I can be truly glad that there will be wonderful joy ahead. And in his timing, he's opened doors for me to step through when he knew I was ready. And God has been caring so deeply for me, healing me and even giving me hope and anticipation. And I'm excited for the future. I went to Chicago in January to the Covenant's Midwinter Conference. To say it was intense doesn't quite capture it completely. The majority of the conversations were about Max, our journey, what had happened, and what's happening now. It was about sharing about missions, about Argentina. And for those of you who knew Max, you know that he would have loved Midwinter. And while it hurt to be there without him, it was such an encouraging, strengthening, and affirming week for me, and even a time of healing. The week after, I spent at the Covenant offices doing my licensing, redoing the budget, having meetings and conversations about moving forward. What does this look like now? How do they support me? And the care that is being taken on so many details is a little bit overwhelming sometimes, but the support is huge. I began language studies online in December, and that will continue in country, in Argentina, where I already have friends, close friends, who we met while we were there and we stayed in contact with. These are friends who are waiting for me to come, not just for ministry, but to walk this journey of life with me. They knew and loved Max. They know and loved me and want to be here for me, to share the memories and the laughter and the tears. And these days, I am actually really feeling, not just knowing, but feeling the hope and the joy and even the anticipation and excitement of moving forward in missions to, to Argentina in God's will, in his timing. I'm one of about 125 covenant missionaries with Serve Globally who serve and support pastors around the world. I'm a licensed missionary now, and ministry will be varied in Argentina. At the moment, all six of the covenant churches in Argentina are going through the Congregational Vitality Pathway. And this is the process, as many of you are aware, to engage pastors and congregations with vision, intention, to be alive, faithful, and fruitful in the spirit, to be healthy and missional. And I was back in Chicago again in mid-March taking a course in order for me to facilitate and serve them in this initiative. I'm not taking anything new from North America to help them or fix them. I am going. I am being sent to serve on them, to serve alongside them. And while I was in Chicago, I was able to meet with my regional coordinators, Eugenio and Pia Restrepo, who were just there in Argentina. And now I know more specifics about my ministry there. So on the vitality pathway, each of the churches are at a different level, and each needs and wants to make changes as they move forward. And I will be there to mentor, encourage, and support the vitality teams, pastors, and leaders I'll be able to support and serve alongside them in order to facilitate the next workshops, to support and encourage pastors and leaders in the churches, 
in Bariloche, where I'll be living, there are two churches, and my ministry there will be serving with church growth and church planting. And of course, I'll be connected with all six churches and be a part of their communities and outreach. And each church has outreach to be a part of, including evangelism, serving in rural areas of extreme poverty, children's ministry, agriculture. The list goes on and on. As well, uh, Chet is the Hispanic Training University in the United States, and I've been asked to assist with administration details and helping with paperwork as needed for people of Argentina. There are also opportunities for me to serve in women's ministries. They've already had an AVA workshop there, which is our advocacy for victims of abuse, and domestic violence is huge down there, especially down in Neoken. And I'm sure that what I'm going through right now in grief will be used there as well. Language studies will be the main focus to start. And my initial three weeks to a month, I will start in the north in Barisatagi and work my way south, visiting each churches, reconnecting with friends, having those conversations about Max. And it's very much on my heart that people will come to Argentina, come and experience the culture, the people, and of course, the food and the fishing and the landscape, but that's just the fun stuff. But come and be part of my mission. Come and expect to be changed. And I am passionate about Argentina, about being a Canadian covenant missionary, but I also want, and I know that this was heavy on Max's heart too, to see more people move into missions and missionary work through the covenant. And I cannot express enough the resources, the immensity of support that we have being a part of the covenant, both local, national, and international. I'll be living in the south in San Carlos Bariloche. And when I leave Canada, I will be gone for two years. After two years, I will return for a one-year home assignment. And at that time, I'll either be taking two additional courses in order to become a career missionary, or perhaps looking at the credentialing to become ordained in word and service, and God willing, return to Argentina. I'm currently looking at June for a departure date, as well as being 100% funded before I leave, and my ministry budget is for two years, and it's been developed with the expertise of Serve Globally, and as of last week, I'm close to 92% funded and I would like to ask for your support, your commitment for two years, your commitment to pray for and with Argentina and myself, your commitment for support of finances, and this could be monthly, quarterly, or annually, or a one-time donation. At the back, there is a table with pledge cards and a sign-up sheet for updates. You can support through our Covenant Church here, um, that support does remain anonymous, so if you do want to receive updates or if it is a monthly commitment, please be sure to let the Canada Conference Office know. But I do want to thank those of you who are already supporting this ministry and to thank those of you who may be feeling drawn to be a part of this. There's certainly a lot more information on my blog as well. And of course, ask any questions that you might have, please. I do have a specific prayer request in addition to praying for this whole process. The Latin America culture is not to leave someone alone. They want to share the laughter, the memories, the tears, and be present on this journey. So that will mean that when I first arrive in Argentina, even before I continue with full-time language study, even while I'm processing being there without Max, I will be having a lot of intense conversations in Spanish. Reconnecting face to face for the first three weeks will be emotional for me. And I will be learn leaning into God even more and relying even more on His grace and His sufficiency to carry me through. And your extra prayers would be really appreciated when I first go. I've been consoled by the words of Psalm 32, 8. I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eye on you. 
and even in the days that are hard, that hurt, I am compelled to continue to serve with open hands and a surrendered heart. Thank you for allowing me to share this, share my journey, this journey of surrender and obedience. And as I close, I'd just like to take a moment to pray with you. Heavenly Father, thank you for your presence here today. Thank you for all that you do in our lives, even when we don't see where you are working. Lord, we don't always understand your ways. Sometimes it makes absolutely no sense to us, but we give you praise and we ask that your will is done in our lives. And there may be people here who you are calling, who you are nudging. You are waiting for them to open their hearts, to surrender and obey. You know our hearts, Lord. You know more about us than we know about ourselves. And may our human need to understand your plans not distract us from your truth, from your will in our lives. And I pray for each and every one here, no matter where they are in life, that they may feel your loving arms wrapped around them and that they would respond to you in faith despite all the junk that clutters our lives. Thank you that we can ask for another way, God, yet not our will, but yours be done. And we know that even in the valley bottom, you are with us. Amen. Gracias y Dios le bendiga.